So, Gamescom is over. I am home and safe. I did not die, which is good news. So, the first thing I want to talk about before I get the vlog done is the big reveal at the Star Citizen after party, which was 3.0. This is going to be the, the patch that we thought was 2.7, but it's now being called 3.0 because of the great amount of content. It's not just going to be procedural planets, as we were told before. It's going to include far more features, more tech, and more content, which is scheduled for the end of this year. The preview of the 3.0 gameplay was up, and it is just outstanding. It blew everyone away. Now, I will be skipping over bits and talking over bits, maybe pausing to highlight some other points of it. If you want to follow the link in the description to the actual full gameplay, if you've not seen it, I suggest watching that first. This is more of just things that I've noticed that I've picked up on looking at different aspects of the game that have changed from what we had, what we know now to what will be in there. So, what we saw, uh, when we first started out, we woke up in Port Olisar, and you can see he has now a new UI which has fuel and oxygen. This is on your spacesuit, so your fuel is for your EVA jets. And your oxygen is obviously your oxygen within the suit. Now these will de deplete and need to be replenished. Obviously if you're in EVA in space and you run out of fuel, you will be stuck there and need to request uh, rescue basically. If you run out of oxygen, you're screwed. So the Moby Glass popped up with a video log and comes from a chap called Miles Eckhart. I love that, they, that he requests you to meet him rather than just saying this is the mission go and do it, let me know when you've done it. It's actually a physical person in the world, you've got to go and meet them to get the, the mission from them. So that requires sort of like an introduction to the mission, where you're flying from system to system. Now the offer of payment is 3,000. It was Alpha United Earth credits. Obviously the current co credits is work in progress. This isn't likely to be final, but I'm glad it's pretty low because you have to do more missions to get enough money to pay for bigger things. Plus, you need to share this between the amount of players that you are working with. So if it's a 3,000 UEC mission, you're not likely to hire a crew of eight and a big ship to go and complete it because you will have no money. If it's a crew of two, like we see here, then you can split it, which it seems like a fair amount. There are a few NPCs around, not as much as they will be. They will be doing other things. Also, something I noticed was the easier emotes. Now, no longer seem to have to type. I think what will they'll do, I think they've mentioned this before, is in you'll choose your favourite emote and then bound, bind them to a hotkey so you can press them quickly. So if you need to wave, if you need to point, it's much more fluid than having to type in chat. Now once we got into the freelancer, we met up with this friend who is to be the pilot. They got into the freelancer and the UI is just amazing. I love this. It's so much more diegetic. It blends with the windshield's curvature, which just looks so smooth. It kind of just spreads it out rather than clustering it all up in one place. It does repeat itself whether or not it's going to do that in the final game or whether it's going to be for the other components. I don't know because obviously we only have a very small amount of uh, ship systems in so far. We would also saw more options for the passenger as well. This was the hardware processor he had with had, which had all the different parts of the ship that he could actually interact with. Very, very cool. So the star map popped up and this was another early work in progress of the Stanton system and how the star map will move. You'll be able to zoom in. You can see moons, stations. Like the web-based star map, it's going to look much more snazzier as well. Again, this is the first iteration. And it looks like you click on the planet and then it jumps you straight to it. Now, we're travelling close to about 900,000 kilometres. And it took, I actually timed it, about 17.52 seconds. So if we're having to travel a, roughly a million kilometres, it's going to take 18, 19 seconds. That is a good amount of time, especially if you're travelling even further. It's going to take even longer. Very, very cool. So the first planetoid we saw was Delamar. Now this is not supposed to be in the Stanton system, this is in the Nyx system. But they put it in because it's kind of ready to show off. Now Levski, which is in the Delamar, which is on the Delamar planet, is an abandoned mining town facility taken over by the People's Alliance, who are sort of anti-UEE political activists. This was done during the Mesa era, so a few hundred years ago. But it's evolved to be a, like a free from the UEE rules. So long as you don't hurt people, you will be left alone. Now he did mention that every planet or moon in 3.0 will be physically done and rendered to be landed on anywhere you want. You don't have to have specific locations. Delamar itself is 2,000 kilometers in diameter and just for scale, I think Earth is around 12,000 kilometers diameter. So it is a very big planetoid, obviously not the full scale planet, but it's big in itself. There's no draw distances, so basically the horizon that you see is the real horizon that you can go to. And something to point out is that the level of details as you approach are very seamless. You can hardly see things rendering in, and this is what they do with ships and everything to help with optimization. So as you start approaching, you'll start to see more and more things popping up, but it's not as you would generally see in other games where they just pop up, 
and pop up in random places. These actually sort of blend in quite nicely and you can see them entering as you get closer. The atmosphere, internals and, exter and exterior just blew me away. It's just the level in which they produce this is astonishing. With the flames, the, the shaking and the noises, just everything works perfectly. Once entered, the sound is also great. You get you get dragged, they say, in a small amount of lift, which is present at the moment, but that will be iterated on more so when it when it gets fleshed out fully. Also, the altitude and your max safe speed is on your UI. This is the speed that you must stay below in order to stay safe, because if you go above this, then you'll start encountering heavier forces on your ship and things may break off or fall off, so you must stay below that speed. I love it when he says puts the ship down wherever you want. It just goes to show that you can land anywhere you want on this planet. You don't have to pick a specific location. It's just wherever you want to put it down, you do it. Now the textures, I'm not sure if they are all completely in yet. I don't think so. It looks kind of like a snowy planet. I know it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be a rocky planet. And I think the textures are going to come more final later on. So ignore them for now. But the buildings that you, you go past, which is all seems to be part of the Levski system, is so, so cool. Whether or not these are little outposts you can visit where they've been mining, I don't know. But it does add that sort of sign of life and sign of, I don't know, technology that they've been working out there for years. Very, very cool. All that goes through my head while I'm seeing this is just the, the sheer scale of this planet. I mean, imagine if you had a breakdown or if you were forced to land hundreds of miles away or even thousands of miles away from from anything that you needed to get to you would just feel so vulnerable lost you would feel quite scared that you're not sure if you're going to be able to get fixed or not and hope that your request uh, pickup beacon or help beacon is going to bring someone friendly and not with other intentions so anyway as he was approaching Levski there was a cool little video on the screen requesting landing permission from Levski control very, very nice touch. I love how in-depth this looks. And you're going to have a look down, you're going to speak to this guy and request landing. In 3.0, he says you will have a certain amount of time to get out of your ship once it's landed before it gets taken to the hangar. So if you if you left your ship, you walk off, that'll get, that'll get removed from the landing pad, taken to the hangar, and then the next ship can land in. I'm not sure how long you'll have before it gets taken away because if you do not get out of your ship, it will also fade to you being in the airlock and then your ship will obviously be taken to the hangar just so that you can't troll the, the landing pads and otherwise people will be waiting for ages whether or not you'll have time to unload goods i don't know whether they'll have an automated system i'm unsure but it's cool because if you are approaching then you may have to wait for landing permission which is kind of true to real life that wouldn't annoy me obviously if you're in a rush it may do but anyway just to point out before we landed at 1414 you could actually see the space station in orbit above the planet, which is a really nice, cool touch. And I just can't wait to see ships flying in or flying across that you'll see in space. It'll just give this whole vast feel of the of the game and just what they're trying to achieve. Now, once he gets inside, again, the variation of interior architecture is so apparent. Doors in particular have their own unique look and sound completely different compared to Olisar and Grimhex. Just giving that difference to it. You could, they could have gone and just used the, the same thing over and over again. But they don't want to do that. They want to make it dense and different. Which is just perfect. He did point out that the elevators are actual moving items in the game world. So you may have to wait for them to come to you. But they do not contain loading screens. So when you're in an, ele when you're in an elevator, you're actually moving up and down in that elevator. You're not just being told you're going upstairs and then suddenly you appear upstairs. I do expect there will be other floors. Nothing has been said yet, but on his way out, you do see the 1 to 6 or 1 to 5. So potentially there will be. Once you got in, you saw this little statue, which is the Remember Anthony Tanaka, which just, again, establishes the law further. So you can feel like there is history there. This is a, a little child that was killed by the forces trying to get into this station. But this sort of solidifies the law. So you feel like there is an actual backstory to the, the whole environment, just making it feel more alive. But when it comes to spawning into a particular place, Chris Roberts mentions that you, when you get to a certain landing zone, you will be able to pay a little money to sort of hire an easy hub style room from wherever you are. And then when you sleep in that place, it becomes your checkpoint. So then if you die, you will respawn in the hospital in that area and have that easy hub as your, kind of as your home for the moment, which is a nice touch. I think that will work well. Whether or not you can have multiple places to spawn and then choose, I don't know. I'm sure they'll think of something. But we saw some really awesome views of the station from the window. I would just love to just stand there watching outside. You know, if you have to wait for a friend who's choosing weapons, it's really not going to be a problem. Just checking out the sites, looking out into the, the sort of mining pit. Very, very nice. 
Now, Chris mentions that you'll be able to buy more counterculture stuff here, like illegal weapons mods. So, it'll, so you'll feel like you need to check the market holders just to check if you're missing out on anything. So if you wanted to certain, maybe overclock your weapon, maybe there's an attachment that you can buy here that is illegal in the UE space, but you can get it here and then hopefully smuggle your weapon into other places. Always going to be worth checking the kiosks, the market holders for what loot they're holding. Walking through, he mentions that proper subsumption is not in yet. Obviously, these people are not doing exactly what they will be doing once it's, once, it's, once it's finished. He said it'll feel like a living world regardless of how many actual players are there. So even if there's none, you and someone else as a real player there, the NPCs will create that immersion. It is a very large place, but I doubt that this is everything. There's so much more that we haven't seen. We only went through a, a small linear path just for the mission basis. So when we met with Miles Eckhart, the animation, the speech was very natural, very fluid. They've done a great job on that. I don't expect this is final because there was a bit of popping in and out as he's, as he's moving and you approach. It's cool to see him using his Moby Glass as often we see people on their phones. It just kind of gives that he's doing something rather than just waiting for you to appear. Now, something I noticed in his speech is he's, he mentioned things like low sex or low security, vented. Kind of a cool use of language, which gives the verse more of a robust, established feeling. Again, like when you see Firefly, they, they, speak, they swear in Chinese, which is kind of just establishing a backstory uh, and creating an identity for the, for the film. So it's going to work for the game as well. There will be certain speeches and certain systems that are unique to that system. And if you visit there, you may get more accustomed to that and start using it yourself. I'm sure we'll be using it in real life. But he gives you the mission, which sounds pretty simple. And before you accept, you're able to back out and just check the details to decide whether it's something you want to go for or not. But again, the 3,000 United Earth credits sort of payment will also need to pay for things like your fuel, your ship repair, any ammunition that you use. And obviously before you leave, you'll need to make sure that you have the weapons that you need, the equipment you need, your ship is fueled enough to make it there, it's repaired enough to make it there. All part of just planning a small, simple mission will make this into a big, long experience, which is what I, which is what I really want. But again, I love how you're left to go about this. You're not just given the mission and then told to go here, told to go there, told to go there, go speak to this person. It's, it's kind of like, this is the location of, what you, of where you need to be. You can go to it however you want. You can arrange the amount of people that work on it with you. You can, you can sort of arrange the approach, the execution, all something that you need to plan beforehand. A simple mission, you don't really need to do much, but obviously things like your fuel, your weapons, will need to be taken into consideration because if you arrive with not enough weaponry or ammunition, you could be screwed if you don't have enough fuel, you just won't make it there. Now, as we were leaving, he mentioned that there'll be a ventilation shaft system that you can go through. There'll be catacombs and tunnels. Some of them won't be monitored by security, so if you are gonna do a dodgy deal, that's the place to be. Or if you are following someone that you need to take out, say a hit, that would be the perfect place to do it. But after he got into his ship and he started taking off, just the incredible atmospheric exit just looks so real it is out of this world the amount of effort they and, and fidelity they have gone to just to get you in and out of atmosphere that is probably one of my favorite parts of this whole showcase but he jumps to the last known location of the star Fairer, which is outside of the moon of delamar again you look at this this moon it's completely different textures to the planet you've got impact craters so so cool something he mentioned was the music system which transitions between music to add atmosphere. So if you're in, if you're in calm space, it's all calm and ambient music. If you're being attacked by pirates, then it changes to a more upbeat, dangerous sort of feeling. But the wreckage of the Star Ferret is incredible. Obviously, we've seen the work they've done on the Idris. Even though the Idris is much bigger, it will till still take a long time to explore this Star Ferret. And if it was me in game and it wasn't a show for, you know, just showing us a small snippet of the game, then I'd be looking around, looking for other bits of cargo that you can smuggle in, that you can take into your ship and salvage. If you have a bigger crew, which obviously with a 3,000 payout, you're not likely to, but you would probably have more people just, walk, like, you know, EVAing around with you, just check, keeping your back covered. So as he's going through the Star Ferry, we saw the warning low power sign. As he's going through, obviously he gets attacked by the pirates. The FPS we'll ignore for now because this is still old, the old FPS. This is not up to date with what Star Marine is going to be like and that is coming later, so it's still the current what we know. Uh, so we'll move on from the FPS, but it is cool to see a little battle inside a, a broken staff area. But we see the warning power low sign. I do wonder if you'll be able to salvage bits and parts from this. I'm sure you will, just depending on what bits are worth more. But it does look like it's too in too much devastation to be able to be fixed up, so I think it is literally a write-off. 
the lighting and the sounds are so cool it feels so eerie there's no power full decompression obviously you know there's, there's the gravity's off so there's things floating about great attention to detail i would be so interested in seeing gravity boots that would be so nice but picking up on the the fps ragdolling it looks so realistic in eva just they've done such a good job there now when he finally makes it into the captain's quarters he comes across the data screen which is what the captain will probably use to check his missions kind of like a, a bigger moby glass allowing you to do all sorts of stuff including mess around with your ship now what we saw was the name which is kind of the weapons you have attached like brand names uh, names of the coolers and the components etc then we had data now this says included or excluded whether this means that it's attached or deactivated from the ship or whether it means that you can include this in the report i don't really know maybe you can miss out things from the black box who knows but then we saw type which is the type of thing it is so gun turret thruster armor and then group which again just sort of groups this into bigger things like weapons thrust or shield so you can you can skip between them now obviously this is not likely to be a final screen but it could just be a simplified placeholder but it does match up with a lot of the screens we see at the moment in format so who knows but there is a time limit for it to download which is pretty cool i wonder if, it, if it's slower then maybe you know people can interrupt you from getting it but i don't think it needs to be too slow and from there we had another video message telling us that we could recover the cargo if we so pleased but this whole experience of EVAing through a derelict starfarer is just, it blows you away when you actually think that you could possibly come across this with friends at random and then decide to either leave it alone if you're on a mission or mark it to come back to, or even just get yourselves ready on, the, on a ship, say if you're in a constellation, get your loadout ready, two of you, three of you, four of you go out, EVA around it, just so much gameplay could come from this one derelict starfarer. Now something to point out, when he goes into the cargo room, you see all this cargo floating around. In the real game, this could contain things that you could salvage, sell on, maybe even use yourself. It did not click with me that that Drake box would hold a dragonfly. I just, it just, for some reason, it didn't even occur to me what was going to be in there. But I thought it looked very cool and you can transport them like that. But as he got the dragonfly and he's flying out, it's just a, an amazing movie shot of him flying through the wreckage. This was one of the, the cool wallpapers we saw that they released a while back. And you can see the moon in the background, which, you know, you visit later. You can actually see that huge moon being really intimidating in the background. And that's a place you're going to go and land. It fits perfectly into the Lancer. In fact, I even think you could probably fit two dragonflies inside that Lancer if you made sure they were close up. And then he transitions again through orbit into the, the moon. When you're planet side and just hovering, I would expect that you will be using more fuel than when in space, because obviously you'll still you'll have friction and gravity pulling against you. You'll need to have that boost going to keep you sort of level. But we're chasing down this Ursa rover, a really cool chase, and it just looks like a perfect vehicle to use while on planet side. There was a cool battle on the surface, drifting the dragonfly like a boss, really cool. And then another awesome chase of the rover, which unfortunately got stuck because I don't think you could see in front of him properly. But inside the, the Ursa rover, it looks like they've borrowed a simple, sort of a very simple set of panels, which will fold away once you stand up. We saw a second seat briefly as he was just transitioning out, maybe using the guns which are mounted on top or what other amount attachments we can use for it. We're not sure yet. But there was some storage on the left, little drawers, four more seats with panels above them. Really nice touch. Now the moon base that we saw is pretty big and it's very detailed as well. The sort of place that you would deliver goods to. But I, I would love to see that in sort of a heavy storm where you're having to take shelter from it and just spend a little bit of time before the, you know, while the storm passes. Now there was a point where he, the, the, the man on the ground ran out of ammunition and this was completely unscripted. But Chris the pilot said he had no loadout and obviously Chris Roberts asked Chris the pilot to get out of his ship an assist but with having no loadout he it wasn't an option so he decided to just fire his weapons and perfectly timed as we turn around the corner you see this ragdolling person just flying away as he got blasted by the starfarer's weapons <laughs> very very cool but then grabby hands came in for the first time we've seen it properly in action where he picks up this cargo loot and to mention that this won't be the only option involving cargo so if you land a ship and you want to unload all your cargo you're not going to have to take one by one every time you can if you want to if you want to do that then that's up that's up to you obviously you'll have things like grav lifts which you can use to pile on like pallets that you can put a lot more stuff on and move it all at once but if you want to speed up this whole process then you could pay an extra cost to get npcs around to help when no npcs are around i'm not sure what's going to happen you'll have to do it all by yourself 
But after that, we saw the double cross. So many things went through my mind when he sort of came down in the Avenger and threatened them all. Mainly, it was just run, get out of there. But I would love to see what happened after. I mean, I don't know. What would you guys do? I would probably run into the, the, the base and hide and try and fight my way out because there's no way you can take them all out in a freelancer. But anyway, after that, Chris Roberts explains that it won't always be about uh, combat. This was just the example they showed. Things like rescuing a downed pilot, maybe delivering medical goods to an outpost will be other options without any combat involved. It is all dynamic. Now, eventually, he said, this is one of the massive things that he said, that you will be able to find a little spot on a planet and make a homestead. Not sure how it will work, whether you need to buy an erect prefab structure or if it's like Skyrim where you can collect materials and then construct it yourself. Who knows, will there be farming? Potentially, you could have full colonies or towns or even a city. I mean, could a planet become fully bustling and populated environment with a full cities and so forth? Potentially, it sounds like you could, but that'll take a lot of years. But he did mention that you can fly your Connie down, load up your rover with goods, drive it to drop it off at a remote station where you are not able to land at. This is all just part of the different dynamic missions that are coming. He says this is using the V1 tech of the planets. V2 is for Citizen Con, so he says it's way better than this, but he wants to save that until it's ready to be shown for Citizen Con. This is the first aspect of the planetary tech. It's not just environmental missions either. They also have character story-based missions Several different characters in each system, eventually giving missions like we will see here. They want to allow the players to interact with each other, which will also create missions itself using your Moby Glass. So if you want to request re repairs or maybe request someone to escort you, that will be in. So there's going to be so many missions that are dynamic and based on the economy and based on what's going on around the actual world itself. It's not just going to be procedural planets, as we were told before. It's going to include far more features more tech and more content, which is scheduled for the end of this year. So he says before the 19th of December, like last year, it's going to be way before that, we hope. It will include the debut of Planetary Tech, as we as we said before, but it'll also include quite the full Stanton system. It's going to have Crusader, which is the current one that we have already, Artcore, Hurston, Microtech. They're also putting in Delamar, which is the sort of in Levski space, the Nix system. It'll have 40-ish space stations, plus over a dozen moons and asteroid belts. It's going to be really dense. And he did say the focus is on density of the play area rather than big numbers. The more focused on building out the world with its lore, its history, its character. So they use procedural tech for the planets to create the planets, but then they are built and by artists and driven by artists. So they're not just going to be created and then left alone. They are properly looked into, making sure that they do feel, and they, you know they do bring the lore, the history and everything that's required. Also, professions will be in. They'll be the very basic of the professions. They won't be fully fleshed out to the to the max. We'll have trading, which is your buying and selling. Cargo transporting. Piracy, so you can, as he said, steal the cargo. Mercenaries, so you can be hired to protect the cargo. And then bounty hunting, which is to get the pirates who initially wanted to try and steal the, the, the cargo from you. So they will all be in, in their basic sort of version 1 forms. Also, the first iteration of Subsumption, which is the new AI system, will be in. This is version 1.0. AI will have more diverse actions. NPCs will have their schedules. They'll have day-night cycles as well, which is going to be cool because we've not really seen the day-night transition in, in Star Citizen. And I'm sure with this new lighting tech, it'll look amazing. Also, increased mission complexity and an economy-driven mission. So... Item 2.0 will also be in as well. It's no longer going to be the simple use feature that is hideous and just jumps right up into your face. This is the CryEngine basic stuff. They're getting rid of that. He says you'll be able to look at, for instance, your Hornet. Choose whether you want to deploy the ladder or open the canopy. Once the ladder is deployed, then you can maybe, you know, choose to, to climb in, to close it again, to put the ladder up. He gave an example of looking at a bottle of water. This will go for everything, not just ships. This is everything in the game world. So you look at a bottle of water, you'll have the option to pick it up or to drink it, um, and then you will do so. This also includes what's called grabby hands, so that's going to be in as well. We'll see that towards the end, and we'll, we'll mention about that. Now, also, you'll be able to change parts of your ship. For example, if your engine blows, you can go. They'll have a component which you look at, so your power plant, say, if that blew up, you look at your power plant. You would look at the subcomponents within the power plant, sort of like fuses. If one is destroyed, you can take that out, then repair it, or if you need to do it quickly, put in a new fuse. A new subcomponent, sorry. Another thing they'll have is called Star Network 1.0, which is the new netcode refactoring. 
This is very important. Again, it's back-end stuff, so you won't really see much as a physical thing, but it's going to increase the performance, plus allow a much higher number of players through the meshed server, which is what they're talking about. Hundreds of players on one server. Mission 2.0 is also going to be in. This is the dynamic missions in which you can interact with AI. It will work with Subsumption. We'll see more of this next, because this is just a preview. Lots more to come. I'm going to leave it there. So, so much awesome. Now, this is the first time I've done sort of a proper trailer breakdown. It reminded me of the GTA 5 o'clocks when Grand Theft Auto was being released. I loved that. So let me know how you like it. If, if you do enjoy it, I'll do more of these when more things get released. Just keeping things out of my mind, putting it onto paper, letting you all know what I'm thinking. Let me know your thoughts. At what point did you really get hyped about this? I mean, what was your favourite part of the video? Tell me in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitch. And I shall see you next time. To Frankfurt, they have added two new people to the planetary tech team. One working on oceans and effects and the other on planet... He's spinning around, frantically around the ship. I think he's managed to click it.